unless you live in some kind of fantasy world, and maybe even if you don't, flying an airplane is just not that hard. Pull the stick back, the houses get smaller, push a stick forward, they get larger. The rest of it is airspace rules and maybe a little bit of weather theory. Yet, we still manage to wreck 1,200 airplanes a year, three or four a day, give or take. That allows people like me to write about airplane wrecks. Airplane wrecks, we write. Another airplane wrecks, we write some more. One of the things we have loved to write about is stalls and stall spins. Stalls first appeared in the literature more than 120 years ago, written by no less than Wilbur Wright. In the intervening years, we have chopped down entire forests, printing articles about how to avoid stalls, and I'm not sure we've even dented the stall rate. What all that shakes out to is this. You are unlikely to stall if you keep your head out of your ass. Yeah, well, sometimes that's not so easy because a few months ago, I stalled the Cub in the worst possible place, the turn from downwind to base. Well, worse would have been in the turn to final, but either way, Cub patterns tend to be tight and kind of low, so let's call it 300 feet. Clearly, I didn't die, but I think I might have gained some sense of how inadvertent stalls catch pilots by surprise and do result in fatalities. I'm not arrogant enough or even good enough to consider myself stall-proof, but I always figured I was still savvy enough to at least avoid one. I'm rethinking that. So here's the setup. I was out shooting a video and the camera batteries died, so I was landing to install fresh ones. The airport I often use for this is a little grass strip south of Venice. Rarely any traffic there, but there are a few of these nested there. This is a red-tailed hawk. It's a common species throughout North America and definitely here in Florida. If you've ever seen one in the wild, you have seen a superb flyer. In my experience, these birds really like to buzz low-flying airplanes, and that's exactly what happened to me. But this wasn't a bird strike risk, more like an unauthorized surprise formation flight. As I was floating through that turn from downwind to base, this hawk approached from the inside of the turn, and as Navy pilots might say, he dropped anchor 10 feet off my left wing, stared right at me as if to say, let's see what you got, dude. I was so mesmerized by this bird that I kept doing what I had been doing without thinking about it slowing the airplane down in a bank. You can imagine where this is going. But before I go on, let's just review stalls. The right way to think about stalls has always been in angle of attack terms, not airspeed terms. We use airspeed because it's a practical surrogate for angle of attack. Now, new airplanes and a lot of legacy aircraft are getting aftermarket angle of attack indicators of various designs. An improvement, maybe, but I'm not so sure they're much better than airspeed indicators at helping pilots avoid inadvertent stalls. They're just another thing to look at that you didn't have to look at before. And if you're not disciplined about it, they're just another gym crack in the panel. And now they even have voices and chimes. However, they are really good for maximum performance landings at the slowest possible speed. So there's that. Stall angle of attack varies with airfoil design, but it's typically between 16 and 20 degrees. Let's use 17 degrees. When the wing AOA reaches that angle, the flow departs and the wing stalls. And as you know, or should know, that happens independent of airspeed. If you can stall a wing at 38 knots, you can stall it at 58 knots if you get the AOA high enough. You can do that with pitch or with bank angle, load factor really, or some combination of the two. And that's the typical scenario for a lot of approach phase accidents. Takeoff phase accidents, which are actually more common, often involve non-turning stalls, sometimes following an engine failure. There are a lot of moving parts here. When you tug the stick back to increase pitch, you've departed steady state flight and put the airplane into a transition. 
The pitch is increasing and so is the angle of attack. Lift is momentarily increasing and so is drag. Airspeed is decreasing and especially if you're in a turn, load factor is also increasing. The thrust vector points uphill and the lift vector angles from the vertical to affect the turn. Kind of busy when you think about it this way. In my case, and this is the real light bulb moment for me, I had the airplane in a transition. As happens to many pilots, tail dragger or not, my landings had turned to crap because I was just flying them too fast. I'd gotten lazy. In the Cub, 55 miles per hour or a little less on short final works well. It will tolerate 48 over the fence. At that speed in a three-pointer, it touches down with minimum energy and no bounce and no need to bleed off speed and ground effect waiting for all this to happen. So in my stall scenario, when Mr. Hawk showed up, I had the airplane in an increasing bank and I was feeding in pitch to bleed off speed. So the bank was increasing slightly, the angle of attack was increasing, and so was the load factor. The airspeed was doing what I wanted to, decreasing. In other words, everything was in motion. And all this is going on while I'm blissfully playing John James Autobahn in the pilot seat. Now, I'm not saying it was the bird's fault. I said I'm blaming the bird. Cubs are actually kind of hard to stall. That fat airfoil wants to do nothing but fly, and it takes a determined pull to get a break out of it, if you can get a break at all. Usually it just mushes along. If you're really brain dead about it, the wake up call is that the stick gets soft and the lower door floats up off the full open position. Although it doesn't always do that. In this case, I never got that far since the instant I felt the mushy stick, I unloaded the wing and added a little power. It recovers instantly. Had I persisted in my rapturous admiration of the hawk, I'm sure his look would have said, Hey, way to go, Einstein, as I mushed into the trees. This was, of course, a turning stall, or a turning incipient stall, if you prefer. So doesn't that increase the risk of a spin? Well, it would if the turn were uncoordinated with yaw toward the inside, but even with hands of stone, I can still fly a coordinated turn. And anyway, just as stalls take work in a cub, so do spins. Remember that a spin is stabilized auto-rotation and the main wing has to be stalled for it to begin and there has to be yaw in the direction of the spin. And not just yaw, but rate of yaw. It's the rate that imparts the momentum to get the rotation going. In some airplanes, it even takes a little pulse of power over the rudder to get a spin started. For all the writing I've done about stalls and spins, the eye-opener here is that distraction caused this. Not an engine failure, not overbanking, and not real loss of control. It makes me wonder if other pilots have been bitten by this by having their attention diverted to another airplane in the pattern or something on the runway or even a bird, just as they have the airplane in a transition from steady state flight to something else. In a transition where load factor is increasing, along with angle of attack, a moment's lapse is all it takes, and a Cirrus or a Cessna might not be so forgiving as a Cub. I wish I could somehow honor those acres of trees we've mowed down trying to clarify these concepts, which are in the end really pretty simple. I got nothing. I'd be the last guy to diss panel gadgets or training tricks to burn this into the reptile brain, but in the end, you just have to accept that a piloting mistake might not be prevented by some mind trick training thing we just somehow haven't thought of yet, but by the habitual discipline of paying attention to what the hell you're doing. It's another way of saying, that if you can just figure out a way to keep your head out of your ass, everything will be just fine. For AbWeb, I'm Paul Bertarelli. Thanks for watching. He had it coming.